Hello everybody, I'm Brian Reynolds and um, this is uh, the first of, I hope, uh, many more uh, Bible meditations that I'll be posting on YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure how regularly I'll be doing it, as, as time permits, as I can fit it into my schedule, perhaps weekly, maybe bi-weekly, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, today's talk is on the second coming of Christ, and I'm not looking at it from a uh, doctrinal perspective so much. Uh, and, that, and what I mean by that is not in the sense of the order of events connected with the second coming of Christ, whether it's premillennial or postmillennial, and all those types of questions. That's not my thought at all today. But just the bare fact of Christ's return as the hope of the believer, and that the central place that that hope and that doctrine ought to be in the life of a believer as revealed to us in the New Testament. And what I've seen the last, oh, maybe 10 years and increasingly over the last few years uh, has been a sort of a, a waning of that thought, a waning of that hope of interest in that amongst Bible-believing Christians. Uh, I was saved during the you know, Jesus People Revival of the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, the coming of the Lord Jesus was something that was on our lips nearly every day. And uh, we had our Maranatha pins on our coat and uh, bumper stickers on our car and so on. I mean, it was, it was front and center. That's all gone now. And I find it, uh, it's a concern really for me. And not only that, I, I've seen and have um, experienced um, almost a sort of a dissing or a belittling of the whole idea of Christ's second coming amongst those who profess to be Christ. And so this is really concerning to me, and so I want to look, what exactly does the Bible say about it? Is it of a secondary importance, as sometimes suggested, the doctrine of the second coming of Christ? Is it something that we can take it or leave it as we wish? As some would express it and, and hold to that sort of viewpoint? Or is it something that is sort of um, at the very um, center of, of the Christian's life or should be at the center of the Christian's life? Our prospect as believers. So I want to start this meditation, and I don't want to go too long. I'm just going to hit on a few scripture verses here just to bring out the idea. In the first place, uh, I'll be reading from is Second Peter, uh, chapter one, and Peter says, "For we did not follow uh, cleverly devised myths when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." So he's speaking here of his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he calls it um, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and why he says that. Because when we turn to the gospel accounts, we see, for example, and it's in all three synoptic gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, mention this uh, in one uh, form or another. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until we see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then we jump into chapter 17 of Matthew's Gospel. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up into the high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So the, the, the ones who would not see death until they saw the coming of the Son of Man were Peter, James, and John. And when they saw the Lord Jesus transfigured before them, they saw him in his kingly glory, his majestic glory, the glory that he will appear in when he, when he comes with all his holy angels and the glory of his Father. They experienced a preview, or as I like to tell the young people sometimes, <clears throat> they saw a trailer of the Lord's coming, just like we have with the movies. And um, uh, so Peter is bringing this out in his second epistle. He says, For uh, when he, that is Christ, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And now Peter says this in verse 19, And we have something more sure 
the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star arises in your hearts. And so what Peter says here, we experienced this. This was in our personal history. But perhaps that may be too subjective for you. So we have this, the prophetic word. It's, it's, it's uh, more sure even because it's God's written word which speaks of Christ's second coming, of that day when he will appear in glory and power. Now, I'll make no distinction between the rapture and the appearing or any of that. I'm not going into that. Just the fact of Christ's second coming. And uh, Peter says, it, it, well, you do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place or in a murky or obscure place. So the world, Peter describes as a dark place. And the lamp of prophecy shines into that and it forms our worldview. It helps us to understand where things are heading and so on. And he's writing this in the backdrop of those apostates that he mentions in his epistle. Further on in his epistle, in chapter 3, verse 3, where he says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So Peter says here, <clears throat> that these apostates in the last days will say, well, where is the promise of his coming? And they scoff and mock at it. And what my concern is, is <clears throat> lately, with even amongst real Christians, this sort of uh, relegating the Lord's coming to like a bottom shelf compartment. Could that be the first step of the place where we scoff and mock at it? Now, certainly the world scoffs and mocks at it. But we're talking here about apostates, those who once held to the truth of Christianity. We know there will be, from the prophetic word elsewhere, uh, that there will be a falling away, an apostasy uh, in the last days. So I'm going to continue along with this theme. So we get uh, uh, Peter's account of the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, uh, there is uh, James and, and John with him. Interestingly, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not on the Mount of Transfiguration, yet they record it. The Apostle John, who was there, he sort of alludes to it in the gospel, his gospel, uh, the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. <clears throat> That's an allusion to it, but he just gives no historical account of it. So we go on with this and we see that every book in the New Testament actually speaks of the Lord's coming. I mean, the sense of the importance of it, the place it has in God's testimony. Now, there are three exceptions to that statement. Uh, Galatians does not mention it. Ephesians does not mention it. And Philemon does not mention it. But all the other books and epistles of the New Testament, Gospels, whatever, they all speak of Christ's second coming. Um, Galatians, of course, Paul's contending for the, the justification by faith, the the, the the, the doctrine of justification was under attack. In Ephesians, the believer is seen as already seated in heavenly places. Not that we're going to go there at Christ's second coming, which is true, but that we are already seated there by grace. And, of course, Philemon deals with the, with the matter of a runaway slave and his master. It's a personal letter. But all the other books of the New Testament speak of the Lord's second coming. In, in fact, some uh, are uh, exclusively devoted to that topic, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, the book of Revelation, deal with that subject almost entirely uh, exclusively. And uh, so what the Lord Jesus has brought before us in his Olivet Discourse, uh, where he speaks of his second coming, at the end of that, he gives a, a parable. He gives several parables, as a matter of fact. But in one parable... He, speak, he speaks of, of, of a, a good servant and an evil servant. And uh, the evil servant, uh, and I should preface this with the fact that parables uh, really present to us one main idea. And we shouldn't eke out or bleed out every detail of a parable and make an application. But the main idea is what we want to look for. 
And uh, in this parable, uh, the Lord says of the wicked servant um, in verse 48, but if that wicked servant says to himself, so he's a servant, that is, he's a professing follower of Christ. Perhaps he's baptized, um, church membership, all of that. Uh, <clears throat> but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and, and an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what I want to show is that, first of all, with the wicked servant, he says, my master has delayed his coming. Not that he has uh, canceled it, or not that he is not coming, but rather that he has delayed it. Now, you know, as a matter of fact, that mostly all of the um, historical confessions of Protestant uh, Christendom will have a statement concerning the second coming of Christ. They don't go into any detail, but it's, it's a part of the Christian doctrine. Um, so they don't deny he's coming, but the question is, has he delayed it? Is he tarrying? And um, he goes on to say with this evil servant, because he felt that the master has delayed his, com his coming, he begins to beat his men servants and maid servants. He eats and drinks with the drunken. And really, what the Lord Jesus is saying here, he's, he, it's a parable, but it's, it's a prophetic parable, really, of the history of Christendom. You know, the first couple of hundred years of church history, Christians believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus to establish his kingdom in this world. They were premillennialists, childless. And um, it was when we get into the, the, the third and fourth century that that particular hope, that doctrine, started to wane and dissipate. But along with that decline of that uh, hope of the Lord's return, uh, the church became also worldly gain political power in the world and eventually uh, you know Romanism and so on grew out of that and uh, clericalism which eventually developed of course into popery we know the whole story and fulfilling the words of the Lord Jesus now it's all coming out how the the the, the men servants and the maid servants the the people that were under them were uh, terribly abused and this is coming out now in the public but it has gone on for centuries and uh, gross worldliness and, and immorality in in the clergy, lording it over the flock and putting them in fear and so on. Uh, but let's note, it all began when the evil servant said, my Lord delayed his coming. And so there's a direct connection with the slipping of the church into worldliness, political power, uh, collusion with the state, and so on. And the waning and the losing of the imminent hope of the Lord's, uh, the hope of the Lord's imminent return. So, this is this is significant. For example, we see a type of this in the Old Testament when uh, Moses went up on the mount for forty days, and the people of Israel said, "This Moses, we don't know what has become of him." And they proceeded to make the golden calf and dance around. It was party time. And so that's a picture, I believe, of exactly what we have before us here. But, you know, the doctrine of the Lord's coming had so much of, of a part of the early Christians that it was actually in the web and woof, so to speak, of their conversion. And this comes out in Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians, where he speaks of their conversion. In chapter 1, verse 9, he says, For they themselves report concerning us what kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols. They were pagans. And Paul brought them the gospel, and they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. And note this, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he had raised from the dead, Jesus who deliver us, delivers us from the wrath to come. So Paul is saying they were converted, they turned from idols to the living and true God to wait for God's Son from heaven. It's part and parcel of their conversion. That's how, how big of place 
that the Lord's return had even in connection with the gospel. So where is it today in our preaching? Where is it today in our gospel? Where is it today in our hearts? And where are we? And uh, so this is a solemn uh, consideration. Now I'm going to look at briefly, and then I'll close, four objections uh, to the study of prophecy. Now, objection number one is, it's the doctrine of the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, is too controversial. Too many conflicting views connected with it. And ultimately leads to disunity amongst Christians. Now, to say that it's uh, too controversial is to hold the doctrine of the second coming to a double standard. Because, let me ask this question. What doctrine of the New Testament is not, has not been controversial? Take justification by faith, for example. I mean, Christians have, have debated that. And Christians have even suffered and died standing for the truth of justification by faith. Um, uh, what constitutes uh, justification? Christ's act of obedience or his paths of obedience? Uh, the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God, what is it? How is it imputed? And all of these questions, strong debates of the sovereignty of God and the free, so-called free will of man, uh, election, uh, free grace versus a man's uh, ability to choose and all of this. These are hotly debated subjects, controversial subjects. And as soon as the subject comes up, we've got a debate. But they say, let's not deal with prophecy because it's too controversial. Well, you're holding prophecy to a double standard. Uh, objection number two, it leads to date setting and brings discredit to the truth. True, some uh, fall into the error of date setting, but you know the Lord Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse, in Matthew 24, that no man knows the hour, no man knows the hour uh, when the Son of Man will come. Uh, only the Father which is in heaven. So that word alone should solemnize our hearts. But you know, Again, I would refer to objection number one and the answer to that because um, people will distort all sorts of doctrines. They uh, will give a false emphasis to it. And I'm not calling for an overemphasis of it, this doctrine. I'm calling for a proper emphasis of it, to put it back in its proper place. And, um, you know, it, 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 um, is, uh, it has been, I believe, being moved out of its proper place, its centrality in the Christian life. But let's not uh, overemphasize it, as some have done, and get off on a tangent and uh, set dates and all that. So they bring discredit. I agree with that, but that doesn't call us to reject the doctrine, just like any other doctrine that has been abused or twisted or misused or used to abuse people or, or whatever. We don't drop the truth of God because others have misapplied it. That's a very simple uh, principle. Uh, the third objection is uh, it was invented by Darby and, and the Schofield Bible. Now this probably refers specific, specifically to you know the rapture and dispensationalism uh, and so on. And that's not my subject. But sometimes the things are sort of morphed together. And to even mention uh, the second coming Christ is to um, bring these subjects up. Uh, but let me assure you that uh, the doctrine of the second coming of Christ was not invented by man. As I've been showing, it's from cover to cover in our Bible, Old and New Testament. And we can uh, disagree with the order of prophetic events and how they all unfold. I personally am premillennial. I'm dispensational. Let's just be upfront about it. I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. I, I believe in the premillennial coming of the Lord Jesus and his glorious millennial kingdom on this earth. But that's not, we can discuss that and that's not my point. Um, but the fact of the Lord's coming should not be a debate. And the dissing of the Lord's coming, again if I can use that word, is something that I've, I have great concern and trouble with. The fourth objection is uh, similar. It uh, is that frame of mind, that thinking that I've been uh, bringing out here, uh, where they say it's of secondary nature. The second coming is of secondary nature. You know, where people say, oh, I don't bother my head with such questions. 
Um, what will be will be. You know, some people say I'm I'm pan millennial. It'll all pan out in the end. This type of attitude. Um, and the answer to that, I say, is to get in your spiritual time machine and take a trip back to third or fourth century B.C. And, and, and to Israel and walk the streets of Jerusalem and go up to any Israelite and ask that Israelite, um, what do you think about the coming of Messiah, that is the first coming? Uh, are you expecting it? Do you believe in it? Now, if these people would say to you, um, you know, it's of secondary nature. Um, I don't really trouble my head with that subject too much. Um, you know, there's too much controversy surrounding, so I don't really think about it. You would say, well, that's heartless indifference. That's cold indifference to Christ, to his first coming. We all love his first coming, you know. He died for our sins. What would you think of an Israelite who dissed the hope of his first coming? Now, take that template and, 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 and superimpose it on, on today. It's the same thing. It's the same thing when people say that. And so the hope of his second coming ought to be as bright for us as the hope of the first coming was for any godly Israelite. And we see this in one uh, Simeon in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. He was a godly Israelite, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, which means he was waiting for Messiah's coming. He was in tune with God. And that's that's my only a point here, is that are we in tune with God? If we're uh, belittling, setting aside, or denigrating the coming of the Lord Jesus as our hope, as the central place in our life, then are we really in tune with God? Are we really walking in the spirit so it's not so much a question of the doctrine of the lord's coming but uh is it our desire and hope it really tests our state it's really a moral question in my mind not a doctrinal one so much it's really a moral question um it's not so much to be occupied with the signs of his coming some get too messed up with that a little bit and read too much of today into the bible although it's certainly interesting we may look at that down the road but we have to be careful with that. But the actual hope of it, because it's his person we want. And death is never presented as the hope of the believer. The blessed hope of the believer is his coming, not death. Paul goes into that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we don't have time to get into it because I'm closing off now. And I'll just close with one final verse, and that's in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Now these are the last words of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Peter, we are reading the last words of the Apostle Peter before he was martyred. And now these are the last words of the Apostle Paul before he was martyred. And he says these words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So for all who have loved the appearing of the Lord, there's a special reward, a special crown. And so again, here we have it, black and white. All who loved the appearing of the Lord. Do you love the appearing of the Lord? Are you looking for it? Are you waiting for it? Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Abba Father, we thank you for this time that we could spend in your word. May the hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus be bright and real in our hearts. We just commit ourselves to you now, those watching and listening, and myself and our families, uh, to your blessing. In the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen.